gentlemen, and welcome to this Monday, October 24th, 2011 edition of InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dyke sitting in. Alex will be back later after he is done with his assignment. Now, coming up on the show, we have a guest. That's Mark Morano from the Climate Depot, and he's going to break down the ever-crumbling official lies about global warming, a scientific hoax uh, that's been pushed for carbon taxes and so much more. He's going to show you just further evidence uh, that it's always been a lie. We're also going to cover other strange news, how DARPA and the Pentagon not only want to control propaganda and get inside your head, but they want to use uh, sensors to electronically and supposedly scientifically monitor that. We're also going to talk about how Queen Elizabeth has joined the 99%. She's with you out there, occupiers. And uh, other news, too. But in the first segment, we're going to cover the geopolitical field. Uh, in the wake of Colonel Gaddafi's death, there are other countries, of course, on the hit list. Now, you know about the Arab Spring, and hopefully you've heard about all the Western backing, the secret, subtle influences. Uh, there's real tensions going on in the Middle East, people really upset over economic and other issues. But at the same time, you do have some very bad players shaping things to come in the region. And Syria has been told that it's next. Among other voices promoting the new talking point is Florida Senator Mark Rubio, who's told Assad that he's next. Quote, if you look at the leaders of Syria, you're looking at today's events, uh, that is Gaddafi's death, as a preview of what your future may hold. Others have repeated this talking point as well. Syrian opposition activist in exile Omar al Mukdak told the Middle East dictators they should pay close attention to the fate of Libya's Muammar Gaddafi, basically a threat to these dictators and an indicator that the hit list does roll on in spite of politics, in spite of economic problems and everything. And joining that chorus, repeating this meme that Syria is next as they forge a path to Iran uh, in the ender part of the game is Senator John McCain, who ran for president. He says the prospect of military options in Syria should be kept open. Quote, now that the military operations in Libya are ending, there will be renewed focus on what practical military operations might be considered to protect civilian lives in Syria, McCain told a World Economic Forum meeting in Jordan. So, of course, it's the last resort to have our troops overseas fighting in conflicts, stirring up wars. Uh, but actually, it looks like they're just looking for another place to go, another domino to fall. What's really going on in the region uh, in this event, larger event that we know as the Arab Spring. We're going to keep a watch on that. But of course, we have other quotes, this one dating back to 2007 from four star general and one time presidential candidate Wesley Clark. Uh, now, we have a clip coming up in just a moment where he talks about a memo he saw. He was briefed on a classified memo back only a few days after 9 11 when people at the pentagon including paul wolfowitz told him that there would be a war with iraq no need for a reason and further disclosed that there was a hit list of seven countries they wanted to target within seven years those include iraq lebanon libya somalia sudan syria and iran uh, at the end of that list and now syria is in the crosshairs we really hope that war doesn't happen let's play that clip now he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office that says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. I said, seven, seven countries in five years. I said, is that a classified memo? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, don't show it to me. He was about to show it to me. He said, because I want to talk about it. And... I, I, I sat on this information I, for a long time, for about six or eight months. I, I was so stunned by this, I couldn't begin to talk about it. And I couldn't believe it would really be true, but that's actually what so happened. So we're told we all need to support democracy in the Middle East. We're told that the Arab Spring uprisings are spontaneous, that it's just, you know, this democratic, you know, pro-people's movement. But really... There's a hit list. They have the countries. They have to rotate the dictators every so often. Really, these dictators aren't good people either, but basically they are all one-time Western partners. Uh, they're pretty much all military train assets in one form or another, just more of the Hegelian dialectic to keep the rest of the region in conflict. 
Now, going back to Senator McCain, uh, not only does he call for military options in Syria, but actually tries to make the argument that the people there want military intervention, that they want U.S. troops fighting wars in their region there in Syria. Let's play those clips now. As I travel across this region, I have met with heads of state and young Democratic activists, business leaders, and military officers, and many others. And nearly every single one of them does not want more, wants more leadership, American leadership, not less. Yes, many people in this region may be frustrated or angry with the United States, but it is more likely because they think we are not doing enough to take their side, support their cause, or act in ways consistent with our values. Iran's rulers would be wise to heed a similar counsel. Their plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador in Washington has only reminded Americans of the threat posed by this regime, how it is killing Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan, supporting violent groups across the region, destabilizing Arab countries, propping up the Assad regime, seeking nuclear weapons, and trampling on the dignity of Iran's people. No identifies the American people and their representatives in Congress more than the need to protect our friends, our allies, and our interests from the comprehensive threat posed by the Iranian regime. So there's a very familiar warmonger uh, beating the war drums for another country on the hit list, Iran, trying to use that totally concocted, contrived, totally phony assassination plot that allegedly took place with the Texas Iranian man uh, and the drug cartels to also try to promote a later Iran war while saying we need this military intervention in Syria. Now, he mentioned the frustrated countries in the region. Another country on that list is Pakistan, has been for a while. They've not only been angry about the invasion of sovereignty over the Obama... Uh, bin Laden raid, uh, but also about the drones over their countries and the secret uh, CIA and other black ops operators uh, just running all over their country. And now Karzai, president of Afghanistan, has said in a hypothetical war between the U.S. and Pakistan, he would back Pakistan. So I guess he's on the frustrated list as well. Who knows, perhaps angry they killed his partner in the opium war, his brother. Uh, I don't know. And something else to watch as World War III, unfortunately, continues to boil up and hopefully doesn't come to a head. In financial news, uh, they are using the larger economic crisis and in particular the situation with Greece to call for more powers. EU president uh, of the EU European Council, Herman von Rompuy, who's also called for a global government, has called for a new euro empire, a single treasury to oversee the tax and spending of 17 eurozone nations. So just more power grabs using the classic Hegelian dialectic technique, a crisis created out of financial problems, and then the global solution as always. His quote here, the proposal put forward by Herman von Rompuy, the European Council president, would be the clear sign yet of a new United States of Europe with Britain left on the sidelines, and they have their frustrations as well. Meanwhile, the Vatican has called for a, quote, central world bank and a global public authority, saying basically that the larger economic problems need to be solved by a super global entity to be run ultimately by the United Nations. Here's what's interesting, though. Uh, you've seen them trying to link Occupy Wall Street protesters to calls for global government, calls for socialism. It's a very diverse group. They haven't called for that. But groups are trying to influence the Occupy movement to adopt those solutions that they're pushing. And here, the Vatican's Justice and Peace Department, more Orwellian nonsense, says, quote, this should be music to the ears of the Occupy Wall Street demonstrators and similar movements around the world who protested against the economic downturn. So it doesn't matter what the root causes of the economic crash are or what kind of solutions would work, but let's just have a global government solution. That is all outlined in their 18-page document towards reforming the international financial and monetary systems in the context of a global public authority. Meanwhile, you've seen world federalist George Soros uh, pushing his Bretton Woods II system and other uh, uh, other new systems to replace what the IMF and other economic situations have been. Now, in other news, there's been thousands of dead birds uh, that are to be removed from the shores of Ontario. 
Uh, it's more bird die-offs. We've seen a real pattern with this, but never really any good explanations. Here, they're attributing it to botulism. And so then here's a related bird die-off story from earlier this year in Little Rock, Arkansas. And they say weather radar shows something unusual around the time the birds fell. Weather radar screen doesn't just show the weather, apparently. Uh, it examined a speck on the radar that showed up around the same time hundreds of birds fell out of the sky. So who knows what that is or if we'll ever get the proper answers, but what is up with all of that? Now, ladies and gentlemen, coming up on November 3rd, we have a special broadcast event. That is the Money Bomb Marathon broadcast. Alex is doing a 24-hour, well, actually, it's a 27-hour broadcast. He's going to have all manner of special guests. And we, in the past, have prepared a lot of special programming as well. I think it's very interesting. It is a fundraising event. That's because we don't have corporate sponsors, and we depend on you buying the books, DVDs, uh, buying from our sponsors, and contributing us, to us directly in order to move to the next level. Now, you've seen this program right here, the InfoWars Nightly News, in its inaugural year, only a few months out since the September 1 official launch. It's taken several years to physically build the studio from the ground up. Uh, we have video we're going to show you here in a moment of Alex's call for the money bomb. And uh, I'm not sure if it's in this video or the videos that are coming out later in the week, but we have footage of physically building up this room from nothing, building the studio, putting in the soundproofing, the wiring, uh, the glass paneling that has to go in, not to mention all the equipment, and of course hiring uh, great new people to the crew who've contributed special reports. You've seen people like Darren McBreen going out into the street uh, and compiling other types of special reports. We have great guys working behind the scenes, new graphics guys, and we want to add even more to this mission to break through all the nonsense in the mainstream and really try to get the message out before it's too late so we can turn this thing around. So I really appeal to you to help us out if you are a supporter and if you're a hater who needs you. Uh, now let's check out this promo video right here. Our mission at InfoWars.com is to audit the Fed, abolish the Fed, restore the Constitution, abolish the TSA, restore the Second Amendment, restore the Constitution, restore the Republic. And if you believe in those goals, then it is your free will, responsibility, and honor to spread the word about our operation and to donate to the 2011 Money Bomb. For many years, I tried to basically stay small, make my films, do my radio show, but it grew and grew and grew. Think about how a money bomb that listeners started four years ago led to us being able to move into this bigger office. A later money bomb helped us expand into the empty warehouse next door. And in the last year, we have built the TV studios and put the equipment in and are now doing a nightly news show every night at 7 o'clock that we're now beta testing and getting ready for television. Right now going out to members at PrisonPlanet.tv and then reaching millions as it spills out onto YouTube and other systems. Help us go to the next level. Not reaching 15 million a week, but reaching 30, 40, 50 million a week. Our growth curve is exponential, but we need to hit our afterburners and turbocharge History is happening now. The war for human liberty against total dehumanization is on now. Join us Thursday, November 3rd at InfoWars.com. We're going to have a 24-hour-plus live transmission with guests and interviews starting at 11 a.m. and running into my next radio show the next day. We're going to have a huge lineup of liberty-loving patriots from all over the world joining us. It's going to be amazing. And this money bomb is going to have a lot of new things added to it that's going to make it even more powerful than past years. So please donate at InfoWarsMoneyBomb.com or InfoWars.com forward slash money bomb or simply spread the word about the money bomb. Stand with InfoWars.com and my incredible crew and all of our other supporters and help us get the word out even more. The ball is in your court. The rest is up to you. It's InfoWars Money Bomb 2011, November 3rd. It kicks off 11 a.m. Visit the website at InfoWarsMoneyBomb.com, InfoWars.com forward slash Money Bomb.
And again, that event will be on November 3rd, 2011, coming up in just a few days from now. Now, on the other side of this break, we have a guest joining us, Mark Morano from the Climate Depot, to break down the larger climate gate global warming hoax that surrounds us all. And right now, if you didn't catch the latest Ron Paul ad, we'll show it here. He's won another straw poll. We're going to talk about that too. Ron Paul, a visionary who predicted the financial crisis, a leader with a plan to solve it. The Paul plan? Balance the budget. Cut a trillion dollars year one. Eliminate five federal bureaucracies. End the foreign wars and nation building. Rein in the Federal Reserve. Pay down the debt. Cut taxes to create jobs. Ron Paul, a plan to restore America now. I'm Ron Paul. And we are back from break on this InfoWars nightly news broadcast. Again, I'm Aaron Dykes. Now we have more news ahead. There was a terror drill at Walcott High School that's in Connecticut. And they hypothesized an intruder in the building, and they have certain procedures they follow. But wait, the police took the opportunity to conduct a drug search of the lockers and the parking lot while the students were on lockdown in their classroom, using one excuse to invade privacy of the other kind. Uh, now, basically, they've asserted there's no Fourth Amendment in public schools. That's what you get at these indoctrination centers. And even the teachers were not informed, according to this article in the Republican American. In other news, DARPA, the Pentagon's research arm, hopes to master propaganda. Uh, Wired magazine reports that the government is already trying to control the message, so why not have science do it in a systematic way, said a researcher familiar with the project. Now, what they're talking about here is a system which, uh, on the surface, sounds like SciTech hokum, but they say they want to take narratives and make them quantitatively analyzable in a rigorous, transparent, and repeatable fashion. The idea is to detect terrorists who've been indoctrinated by propaganda. And this is going to be a long study under the name of Narrative Networks. They even have job listings linked in the article and the synopsis of the uh, research, if you can call it research. And what they want to do is identify groups who are vulnerable to terrorist recruiting tactics, or so they say, and they want to learn to counter the message. But really, they go on to admit what they want to do, in part, is track social movements. And they say the first 18-month phase of the study Researchers would look at how stories infiltrate social networks and alter our brain circuits, uh, leading to political radicalization. Now, if there were terrorists under every bed, maybe somehow this would be a good idea. But here in reality, it's about the most Orwellian thing I've ever heard. In fact, George Orwell wrote that the last free space remaining under the 1984 system was those few cubic inches inside the brain. And now DARPA uh, and the Pentagon, well, it's really not their first attempt. They're trying to infiltrate even that space. And this totally reeks of pre-crime. It totally takes... Uh, it totally reeks of branding uh, political ideas as extremist and so forth. Now, just last week, you saw Alex talking to the spokesperson from Demos. That's the front group that's going in to re-educate school children about how uh, information on the Internet can't be trusted and how really only government information is believable, uh, you know, without, of course, proper research and, and verifying of sources. And it really links in, too, with Cass Sunstein's plan and part of the overall cybersecurity agenda to go online and even in the flesh to infiltrate and undermine conspiracy theorists because after all anyone who calls out what a joke and a hoax the war on terror is really needs to be broken up ideologically so they don't influence people against the establishment beliefs just unbelievable something else to keep an eye on new technology the pentagon says they're wasting money on in the midst of this budget crisis very interesting. In other news, Ron Paul wins another straw poll in the major state of Ohio, uh, which has always been an important state for general elections. The Texas Republican continues to trail former Mitt Romney in national polls, but he's won this straw poll with 53 percent of Ohio Republicans. Now, one thing you notice here is that Ron Paul has won 
uh, probably most of the straw polls. I think uh, there's charts showing he's the overall leader of the cumulative straw poll results for the 2012 cycle, but nobody really reports when he wins. They report when Michelle Bachman buys all the votes for the Iowa straw poll, or when Herman Cain, a manufactured Federal Reserve candidate, wins straw polls. But they never want to talk about Ron Paul. And here he is winning again, and he's raising a lot of money, too. Now, we also have a clip from Ron Paul when he was on Meet the Press with the very fair and balanced, credible, independent journalist David Gregory, who basically accuses him of trying to undermine the economy and create another crash. But as you know, Ron Paul really just wants to get the money out of government and back into regular people's hands. Let's play that clip now. How is that possible that a draconian cut like this would not hurt anybody, particularly in this economy? Because we have to take this money from the economy and the people, politicians get to spend it. So that's a negative. It hurts the economy. After World War II, we cut uh, spending by 60% and cut taxes. 10 million people came home. And all the money and the expenditures went back to the people. And that was finally, we got over the Depression by having these draconian cuts. So you have... And there's, of course, a lot more to this clip. We're obviously not going to show the whole thing, including some of the snarky comments from uh, David Gregory. But let's play another clip here where Ron Paul talks about his philosophy. The question I ask myself is, what should the role of government be? And I've come down on the conclusion that it shouldn't be that we're the policemen of the world and we have this runaway entitlement spending. So therefore, if the role of government is the constitutional approach, you can't keep spending like this because now we face this worldwide crisis of sovereign debt. That's our right. big problem, but you, but you can't uh, deal with that. Unless now, on the Occupy Wall Street front, you're seeing all manner of Democratic and Wall Street figures saying they sympathize, they feel the pain of the protesters. But now, uh, I guess you could put Queen Elizabeth in that bunch. She's now facing energy cost problems at her palaces uh, as the money given to them by taxpayers is supposedly approaching the 10 percent point that would put her in, quote, Fuel pro poverty, uh, that's a propaganda story from the Financial Times, a government organ, really, globalist organ. The queen herself prowls the corridors. This is the biggest joke of all. The queen herself prowls the corridors of these palaces, switching off superfluous lights, a Buckingham Palace employee said. The royal accounts show the queen electricity and gas bill was 2.2 million, a 2.2 million pound uh, electricity and gas bill in 2010 to 11 or 6.9% of the monarch's total income. That is, of course, just her government income. She makes much, much more as one of the world's largest landowners. She also makes a lot of money in uh, underhanded deals and other stuff as well, uh, but that's another matter. But I guess you could say she feels the pain. She's one of the 99%. Uh, so take that, Wall Street. Uh, now, in green news, the global warming and climate change hoax continues to fall. We know it's just a man behind the curtain, whether you want to say it's Al Gore or what. And we do have a, a guest joining us in just a moment to discuss this. His article here, uh, Scientific Case for Man-Made Climate Change is Dead, and that's Mark Morano in the Washington Examiner. Uh, we also have The Hill. Study finds no evidence that climate change caused more severe flooding. A new study conducted by federal scientists found no evidence that climate change has caused more severe flooding in the U.S. during the last century. Despite what we've been told, told the science is settled and the rest of it. Uh, there's also from the Climate Depot a story about MIT's Richard Lindzen and physicist David Douglas, uh, who say Mueller's findings on warming are nothing remarkable. The best study does not alter climate gate serious breaches of ethics. And again, it's the argument that just because there's been a warming trend, somehow that's due to man-made CO2 output. Uh, just totally ridiculous. We're going to get into that and a whole lot more in this interview in just a moment. And there's also the big freeze that Britain is expecting uh, with snow starting in October. This is expected to be the biggest freeze in 100 years. And in other news, we turn now to Mark Morano of the Climate Depot. Uh, he runs that website, which covers the global warming and climate change fraud and hoax. Uh, he's also formally on the U.S. Senate Committee for Environmental and Public Works. He's been in other news and media as well. Mark, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. So there's a lot uh, breaking down from this big fraud on global warming then. Yes, there is. This is a um, 
shocking for a Monday. We're only one day into the work week, and we have just a, a, an incredible amount of developments uh, coming down the pike today. The federal government has announced that there's no connection uh, with U.S. floods and man-made global warming going back more than 100 years. And even more shocking than that, there is actually there actually is a connection, and it's actually the more CO2 there is, uh, the and the more global warming they allege the less floods we're having. They're not finding any trends. Uh, today, I posted a teaser to the full report that we're gonna be coming out with at Climate Depot. From A to Z, the case for man-made global warming fears has collapsed. And we're talking about mother nature leaving, uh, leaving egg on the faces of the promoters of man-made global warming. And we start with the Antarctic, which has been at or near record sea ice extent, showing as a whole, it's actually, depending on where you, how you look at it, it's cooling and it's actually gaining ice. The Arctic, which has not reached the low point it had in 2007, which was only a 30-year low point. Uh, sea level, which people were warning Al Gore's film showed half of Florida underwater. Sea level, mm -hmm. far from accelerating, has actually dropped. NASA said there's been a two-year drop, and now the European Space Agency says sea levels are about the same level they were in 2004 currently. Uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, which Al Gore spent time in his film talking about the snows of Kilimanjaro would be no more. That has now been gaining ice and snow, defying Al Gore. Malaria, you know, massive drops in malaria rates, contrary to global warming. Cholera, the same thing. Um, and if you get into ocean heat content, ocean heat content failing to warm as they predicted, global temperatures, satellite records show 90, 1998 still the high point in temperatures, and we've remained steady or cooled. Many scientists predicting coming global cooling. They're predicting a horror winter in the U.S. this year, I'm sorry, in Europe this year, and the U.S. is going to have its coldest winter in a decade. So across the board here, they just it just keeps coming. The hits keep coming. And one of the things uh, that also came out today, melting glaciers aren't producing uh, fresh water shortages. This is one of the big scares the UN said that we we're going to have all these glaciers disappearing and we we're running out of water. That's not happening. Other people have said climate change is going to cause more forest fires. A new peer reviewed study out today showing that's not the case. I can't even keep up A to Z collapse of this movement. Um, and what does the media, the media in reaction to all this has a man named Richard Mueller from Berkeley, Berkeley, who's come out now and written in the Wall Street Journal of all places, that his new study shows that yes, we've warmed since the 1950s, therefore there's no cause for skepticism of global warming anymore. Hmm. It is the most bizarre thing I've ever heard a global warmist promote, and even more insulting, the media is claiming that Richard Mueller from Berkeley is some kind of skeptic. He's been a, he is such a committed believer in global warming that he resigned from the Sierra Club in the early 80s because they were anti-nuclear, and he believed we needed more nuclear energy in order to fight global warming. Uh, he was critical of the climate gate scientists, but that does not make him a skeptic. So the media is claiming any warming trend equals proof of man-made global warming, but they are being, the entire movement is being stripped bare as subprime science. And we've got a movement that really never was scientific. It was always political. And the whole hoax of the science was settled uh, was really kind of classic criminal behavior of hurry up and give me the money before the authorities come around. Yes, and what happened was 1988, the United Nations got involved in the climate picture. In the 1970s, we had you know many organs and science, scientists and scientific groups, including the CIA, National Academy of Science, warning about a coming global cooling. Well, that sort of faded quickly. Uh, we were actually at the end of a 40-year cooling period in the 70s, and then we warmed up from the late 70s to the late 90s. So again, the high point in temperature is 1998. So they switched gears, and you can literally find where they talk about droughts, floods, tipping points. All the same rhetoric was used about man-made global cooling in the 70s. Yeah. They just switched it over and then warned the same exact things, more storminess. It was as if no shame. And so what happened was the UN got involved and corrupted everything. In order to be a scientist with the UN, governments have to pick you. Well, governments aren't going to pick skeptics generally. And we're finding out that a huge, it's the, the IPCC lead authors uh, and the people writing key reports, it's filled to the rafters with environmental groups. And it's, it's, this has come out in a new book, actually, that's detailing all this. This was an activist organization that knew what their global warming reports were going to write years in advance. The head of it, Regina Pachari, has actually said, wait till the next report and see how shocking it is. And the report would be years away. This would be like they were calling the shots. This was not science. Uh, this was subprime science. And it's been exposed. It's been laid bare. Um, the United Nations treaty process is now in shambles at the moment. Uh, it could always be resurrected. 
Uh, in fact, uh, you know, some of our presidential candidates, Mitt Romney is on record in 2007 as saying he favors cap and trade, but only on a global level, a UN level. Now, I believe he may have recanted that, but it's still a danger. And the danger is, actually, I will argue this, the danger is Republicans who push this because a Democrat, President Obama will be opposed at every dumb idea he has with global warming. Republican president, every dumb guy will be supported by Republicans because he, because of uh, part because of partisanship. Um, I would argue that opposing a president, the Republicans partisanship is the greatest defender of liberty. In other words, when Republicans will oppose the Democrats' ideas, the danger is a Republican espousing these ideas. That's when we have the danger of them actually passing. So, do you see carbon taxes actually coming to fruition? Because there's a lot of people who want that in the agenda, but of course it has broken down. There's been a lot of resistance and fight back to the global warming propaganda. There has, I mean, in 2009, this movement was so collapsed, pre-climate gate, I may add, that even people like uh, Minnesota Senator Al Franken had bailed out of the congressional climate bill. It wrote a letter with nine or 10 other Democrats saying they couldn't support it. When you lose Al Franken, you have something that's political poison. The problem is uh, President Obama has moved to the Environmental Protection Agency. And despite the fact that the science has collapsed, despite the fact that EPA's own inspector general found they didn't even follow their own scientific procedures in coming up with this so-called CO2 endangerment finding, the idea that what we exhale from our mouth is somehow now toxic and poison, uh, we inhale oxygen, we exhale CO2. And for the first time, the United States government is going to be regulating what we exhale from our mouth. Um, he who controls carbon controls life. That is our great threat right now. Uh, even a President Romney has said he opposes all this now, but the problem is he was so deeply involved in this. He had, he had John Holdren as one of his advisors in Massachusetts when Romney was on his global warming kick. And he also had several key Obama appointments uh, from Obama's EPA that were surrounding Romney at the time as well. So it's very scary to look at that because a Republican pushing this stuff will be very successful. President Obama with a split Congress will be very unsuccessful, most likely. And so voters have to consider that uh, when, they, when they choose who their nominee is going to be. So just for the viewers who may not be following the name game here, you're talking about John P. Holdren, Obama's yes. uh, global warming and White House czar, uh, who calls for a $4 billion, $4 billion person genocide over overpopulation and who's experimenting with this geoengineering in the atmosphere over global yes. warming. Uh, we have Romney of Romney Care uh, now kind of working also with the global warming people. Yes, and he, he, Romney's denying it now, but just keep in mind, Romney reiterated his belief in man-made global warming science. We had the absurd and, and, and surreal uh, spectacle this past summer of Al Gore criticizing President Obama for not doing enough on global warming and taking time out to single out only one Republican, Mitt Romney, for, for his belief in man-made global warming. So, so Romney is the only Republican to have got an endorsement of sorts from Al Gore. Well, Al Gore is unhappy with President Obama. So that's a, that's a shocking development right there, which the media hasn't reported. And shockingly, the other Republican candidates haven't reported. Why hasn't Ron Paul brought this up? Why hasn't Rick Perry brought this up? Romney is getting a free ride in these debates. John Holdren uh, was partnered up with Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich proposed forced sterilization agents in our drinking water in the 1960s and 70s. This, John Holdren opposed the agricultural revolution of Norman Borlaug, who won a Nobel Prize uh, because he fed billions of people. John Holdren opposed it because he didn't want the earth to hold that many people. John Holdren said one of the, ha one of the hazards of a free society is energy that's too cheap. Mm -hmm. This man uh, has been wrong about overpopulation. He's been wrong about global warming. He's embarrassed himself on global warming. John Holdren, Obama's alleged science czar, has come out and warned of the loss of winter ice in the Arctic. And you can't find an alarmist scientist in Al Gore uh, to come out and make that claim. He's making bizarre claims that aren't even supported by his fellow ideologues. So this is a man Romney needs to denounce. But again, not a single Republican has brought this up in a, in a high-profile debate at any rate. And it's just... It's stunning to me that Romney is coasting to the nomination. Yeah, he's really worthy of more scrutiny. Now, you mentioned in the opening how there's record winters, what they're calling a horror winter in yeah. Europe, uh, one of the coldest winters of the decade in the U.S. expected. What is that going to do uh, when they try to pr push this propaganda in the winter 
season. Well, yeah, we have to, skeptics have to be a little careful. We can't use, you know, we can't say every snowstorm is proof that there is no global warming, but sure. we don't really do that. We don't usually have fun with it. We point out uh, that, you know, there's, there's record snow because there, because it's the global warmest who've come out originally. We had people in, the, in East Anglia, the Climate Gate University, actually say a few years ago uh, that the snows are a thing of the past, that children, we had the New York Times column that's saying children won't know what sledding is. So it is always fun when we have record snow and cold to point that out. But of course, Al Gore, global warming alarmist, New York Times, don't skip a beat. They come out immediately and say, well, this is consistent with man-made global warming. The extremes are going to be much worse. Snow is expected. But you go back to Al Gore's 2006 film, Al Gore doesn't once warn of record snowfalls, blizzards, and increased and record cold winters ahead. He warned of global warming, but this is their ability to shift on a dime because none of the science has gone their way. So they're now, they're panicking and they're now looking, this is akin to medieval witchcraft. They're basically telling Americans now that Al Gore has 24 hours of climate reality, which he had about a month ago now, every weather event, negative, hurricanes, floods, droughts, hurricanes are proof of man-made global warming. This is the medieval equivalent of saying we never had crop failures in bad weather until those witches moved in. What Al Gore is saying is we never had this kind of weather until you drove your SUV around. This is not science. This is astrology at its basis level. And there are real human sacrifices today. The Obama administration is helping prevent coal-fired power plants in Africa based mm -hmm. on environmental concerns, on global warming concerns. India has told the UN to stop pressuring them to sign on to to these emission limiting treaties because 40% of their residents don't have running water and electricity. In Africa, the country of Chad, they banned cooking by charcoal and leading to quote, desperate families, unquote, uh, because of global warming concerns. This is a perverse reality where white wealthy Westerners are telling poor people of color, 1.6 billion people estimated don't have running water and electricity in Africa, South America, Asia, that they can't have what we have. And that is where I think the greatest uh, immorality of this entire movement is. Instead of promoting development, instead of promoting economic growth, we have global warmest activists calling for planned recessions to try to prevent global warming. This is a, and they also calling for you know, international CO2 budgets for every man, woman, and child on the planet. So it's a very scary situation. And the problem is both Bush presidents, Bush one, George Herbert Walker and GW Bush, both accepted the premise that the United Nations was a font of science. Both accepted the premise that global warmest ideologues should be funded at full hilt by the U.S. taxpayers. George Bush didn't stop the funding. George Bush gave intellectual support and legitimacy to the United Nations climate reports. The first George Bush in the early 1990s went to Rio and signed the UN, under the UN Biodiversity Treaty, which yeah. was the framework for the Kyoto Protocol. What I'm getting sure. at here is Obama has virtually done nothing on environment and climate, comparatively speaking, in his four yeah. years. Well, I think we know it is all political, and uh, we do thank you for joining us. We'll keep an eye on that, and I think it's obviously a continuing agenda, despite the presidents on either side of the spectrum as well. Mark Morano, ClimateDepot.com. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the InfoWars Nightly News for tonight, Monday, October 24. Tomorrow, Mike Adams. Wednesday, Alex Jones returns. Uh, from his trip out to the West to do TV work. He'll be back. Stay with us and help support InfoWars Nightly News. Spread the word to your friends, family, and contacts. November 3rd, 2011, InfoWars Money Bomb. Good night.